I'd say Dawn is typically the most popular mycotoxin in terms of research and what is talked about. It's not necessarily the most potent. When we look at levels, we often talk about you know, levels above one ppm of Dawn, whereas something like aflatoxin, we're talking much lower levels to have effect uh, in pigs especially. Um, but yeah, Dawn is typically the big mycotoxin that everyone talks about, uh, produced by a fusarium species of mold. And I think the reason it's so talked about is because the effects are seen rapidly and it affects different areas in the pig. It's not specific. So, you know, it can affect things like tight junctions in the intestine. Um, it can also increase free tryptophan in the blood, which can suppress appetite. Um, it can even affect glucose transporters in the gut as well. So its effects are, are wide ranging. Welcome to Swinet Canada. My name is John Patience and I'll be the host of today's podcast. With me today, I have Tyler Burnham, uh, who is a nutritionist with Nutrition Partners, and he will be talking to us today about uh, mycotoxins and their impact on pork production. Welcome, Tyler. Hi, John. Thanks for having me. And so, Tyler, um, you've listened to these podcasts before, so you know my very first question is very predictable, and that is for the benefit of our listeners who may not be uh, familiar with you, or maybe uh, it would be helpful for them to become more familiar with you. Could you please give us a bit of your background, um, where it all started? I see you went to the University of Calgary, if you're a Calgary boy or an Alberta boy, and uh, and then how you managed to get yourself to where you are today, please. You, you bet. So like you said, born and raised in Calgary, uh, attended University of Calgary, where I got my bachelor's degree in biological sciences. Didn't really know what I wanted to do coming out of school, but I knew I was really into the sciences. Um, I always excelled in biology, so I thought that'd be a good approach. And coming out of university, I did a brief stint with the local health region in Calgary. And then following that, I was hired on with the Nutrition Partners Group of Companies to manage their retail pharmacy. So dealing with over-the-counter antibiotics and that sort of thing. And that role eventually grew into a technical service role with our poultry team, uh, followed by a nutrition role with our poultry team. And I worked in that capacity for the last seven or so years. And then the previous three years of my life have been spent on the swine nutrition part of our business. Wow, that's uh, that's quite a quite a background, Tyler. And uh, and all the more reason why we're delighted to have you on the Swine Net Canada uh, podcast today. So let's, uh, let's uh, turn our attention to mycotoxins. And that was the topic that you suggested. So maybe my first question to you is, why did you suggest mycotoxins as uh, as a good good topic for us to consider today? Yeah, that's a, a great question. So working in a, a micro premix manufacturing facility, we're exposed to a lot of these products that claim to do different things in terms of mycotoxin binding. So we're presented with dozens of products. And as nutritionists, it's our job to recommend these products to our customers. And we have to do so on an educated basis. Um, so the mycotoxin topic is interesting to me because of the so many different products with so many different strategies. Right, and uh, yeah, it is, uh, it is a, a complex uh, subject, and we'll talk about the products more uh, a little bit later in the, in the podcast, but let's talk about mycotoxins themselves, and are they a particular problem this year? I'm, I'm located down in Ames, Iowa, and I also live part-time in Toronto, which doesn't give me very good insight into the status of, uh, of uh, the harvest in uh, on the prairies, but I understand that the harvest is well advanced. Is that correct? Yeah, harvest is well advanced out here. Um, for the most part, we've had a more typical growing season this year. Uh, harvest has been slightly wet. I wouldn't say it's, it's above average, but there has been some challenge putting wet grain into the bins right now. Um, but where we are geographically, obviously, toxin prevalence is a bit different to other parts of the world. You know, we typically see lots of Dawn, uh, Zerelanon, Femonazin, you know, whereas other parts of the world like Europe and Asia, aflatoxin tends to be the most prevalent in those crops. The Nutrition Athena, Shakespeare Mill, Farmhouse and Nutrition Partners Nutrition Group offer the full range of nutritional product based on extensive research and developments and a solid team of experts all across Canada. Our objective is to provide cost-effective solutions, innovation, and support to producer from the entire Canadian swine industry. Right, right. 
yeah, you're you're um, a little cool and a little wet for aflatoxins to typically be a problem. That's not to say they're not going to be a problem, but not typically. I'm I'm um, I'm going to want to come back and delve into fumonisins, um a bit more deeply, uh, Tyler, in in a few minutes. But first, I I would like to talk about I guess maybe the mycotoxins that we maybe know a little bit more about. Uh, now that's my interpretation. Yours may be may be different, uh, but fumonisins have always challenged me in part because we don't. I don't think we got have good information on acceptable levels, and uh, and even with seralanone, um, we down down in the U.S. we hear producers talking about issues with seralanone in sows that at levels that are lower than the recommended acceptable level for seralanone. So I'd like to pursue that with you, but let's let's start with Dawn. That's the most common one. That's the one that <clears throat> uh, people uh, seem to fear the most. Um, where 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 does Dawn sit into the hierarchy of mycotoxins? Now, is it still the big dog at the top of the list, and Zralnone, Fumonisins, and all the others are below it, or have the others moved up, and Dawn is no longer the the, the big dog of mycotoxins. Yeah, good question. I'd say Dawn is typically the most popular mycotoxin in terms of research and what is talked about. It's not necessarily the most potent. When we look at levels, we often talk about you know, levels above one ppm of Dawn, whereas something like aflatoxin, we're talking much lower levels to have effect uh, in pigs especially. Um, but yeah, Dawn is typically the big mycotoxin that everyone talks about, uh, produced by a fusarium species of mold. And I think the reason it's so talked about is because the effects are seen rapidly and it affects different areas in the pig. It's not specific. So, you know, it can affect things like tight junctions in the intestine. Um, it can also increase free tryptophan in the blood, which can suppress appetite. Um, it can even affect glucose transporters in the gut as well. So its effects are, are wide ranging. Right. Um, it used to be, uh, Tyler, that Dawn and Zeralinone were serious problems in Manitoba. And then they gradually moved into Saskatchewan and spread across Saskatchewan. Um, are they um, a, a serious issue in Alberta or as serious an issue in Alberta as they are in, for example, Manitoba? Yeah, good question. Uh, from our in-house lab here, we have a basic mycotoxin testing facility. And typically we see the Dawn more prevalent in corn um, as well as the Ralinon. So Manitoba, Saskatchewan, a bit more corn than we typically see in Alberta. So in that case, uh, I'd agree with you that we typically see more Dawn, more Zeralinon coming out of those two provinces. Um, you mentioned your lab. Tell us a little bit more about your lab. Um, uh, not a lot of private labs out there doing mycotoxin work. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your capability there? Yeah, you bet. So we've got a very basic lab here with NAR equipment uh, in place, as well as particle size testing. And then we have a very basic mycotoxin uh, test kit that uses lateral flow strips. Oh, okay. So a sample gotcha. is prepared, ground, and then it quantifies based on the concentration on the strip. So we use it more of an indication as opposed to the ability to quantify, if that makes sense. Right on. You betcha. So if I'm a pork producer and I walk into my barn one day and things just aren't quite right, how might I know that uh, Dawn is a problem? So Dawn, you're going to see clinical signs, but like I said, they're sometimes nonspecific. Um, the typical sign people think of when they think of Dawn is reduced feed intake. So this is a result of, like I said, Dawn can cross that blood-brain barrier through different metabolites, and it can increase hormones that suppress appetite. So the first thing you typically see is a reduction in feed intake. Um, there's been good work done by INRA in France on this topic. So they fed pigs with a diet of 3 ppm of Dawn um, just at one instance in time in the finisher phase, and they saw a huge reduction in feed intake. Uh, they followed that same group through and fed those pigs again a few weeks later with an instance of Dawn, another 3 ppm, and the same response was seen. So they're not developing any sort of mechanisms to cope with the secondary Dawn challenge. It seems like it seems to hit them the exact same the second time. If I, so if you hit them with a single dose at one point in time, that's what you would see. But in commercial practice, you're more likely to see an ongoing 
intake situation, right? Correct. So a commercial setting, yeah, it would be totally different. So we're talking basically acute versus chronic challenge, right? So in the acute challenge, we typically see that feed refusal refusal, um, versus chronic challenge, we typically see changes to the gut. So that Dawn can slowly work on the gut. It can block those glucose receptors and transporters in the gut. It can also have an effect on the microbiota in the gut. So these are things you're not going to see overnight or even in a couple of days. Um, but you'll see a general decrease in performance of your herd. Um, so the chronic challenge is probably, like you said, more likely on a farm level. Gotcha. Okay. Very good. Well, that's a that's a good quick overview of Don. Let's turn our attention to Zeralinone and let's kind of follow that same path in terms of what the mode of action is, um, Tyler, and then also what the pork producer might see or look for if he's concerned about uh, Zeralinone toxicosis. So Zeralinone is a bit unique and it's uh, in the sense that it's not your typical mycotoxin. Zeralinone actually mimics estrogen. So Zeralinone combined to estrogen receptors create effects that we'd see from basically hyperestrogenism. Dawn really, or sorry, Zeralinone really affects uh, mature animals, um, pregnant animals, lactating animals, any animals that are involved in reproduction. We typically see uh, a larger effect with Zeralinone. What might those at, let's say at a low dose and then at a higher dose, what might we expect to see then given the the, that mode of action you have described. So at the, at the chronic low dose level, we typically see a reduction in performance of the sows. So you might have increase in culling due to increased wean to estrus period, um, increase abortions, things like that. Um, versus an acute case, we can see things like swollen vulvas in, in gilts that are far from being mature. Um, and it can actually cross into the milk of the offspring as well. So suckling piglets, uh, Scott Horse did a trial in 2021 where they fed 300 PPB of Zeralinon and they actually saw effects in the suckling piglets from sows that were fed those diets. Right, right. Yeah, nobody ever said that mycotoxins were nice to work with. I, I neglected a, the, a really important number that I should have asked you for with Dawn and then also for Zeralinone. What are the levels that you, uh, would like to see your your customers stay below when it comes to Don and when it comes to Zeralino. So the numbers published by CFIA, they have their recommended limits and these limits often only consider these mycotoxins on their own, doesn't consider any combined effects. And most of the time we do have more than one mycotoxin present. So the numbers put out by CFIA on, uh, on Don or vomitoxin is usually one ppm. But the literature is really good evidence that there's effects seen as low as 0.25 ppm or 250 ppb with Dawn. Um, and then with Zeralinon, a little bit lower concentrations, we typically say a high risk Zeralinon diet is 75 ppb. But again, we have to consider the interaction of all these mycotoxins together. You know, when we mix grains together in a complete feed, we're creating a cocktail of mycotoxins. Whereas Oftentimes, we only consider single feed ingredients when testing for mycotoxins. Right, right. Um, and your comment about cocktails will come back when we talk about um, sampling and testing and so on of of of, uh, of a crop as an ingredient as compared to a to a diet. Okay, let's turn to my not my favorite topic, but a topic that I've found intriguing over the years, and that's fumonisin. Uh, and again, let's kind of go through the same uh, same thing. What are the clinical symptoms and uh, what are the, the levels that uh, might be causing problems? For sure. So fumonisin is, is unique in that it affects DNA and RNA synthesis mainly in the liver and in the heart. So typically we see issues arise um, with fat cells replacing regular liver cells. And we also see often secondary infections like respiratory infections caused by fumonisin. So if fumonisin opens a door for things like salmonella and E. coli to come into the animal. So oftentimes fumonisin, um, the diagnosis might be secondary. You know, you might see a salmonella E. coli infection when the underlying cause is actually the fumonisin infection. 
Right, right. Okay. And what are the levels that you would uh, would like to, to see not exceeded? And, and you can't say zero, uh, Tyler. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, ideally zero. That's the goal, of yeah. course. Yep. Um, but typically, we say moderate risk levels, we say about 2 ppm in the complete feed for fergonacin. Okay. And that's the sum of all the fumonacins. Is that right? Okay. Gotcha. Okay. This is a question that I've had on occasion. Dawn is a bigger issue with grow finish pigs. Well, wean to finish pigs. Zeralinone is a bigger issue with sows and fumonacin is, uh, is, a, is a problem with both. Would you consider that a, a reasoned statement or just an, an oversimplification? I think that's a reasonable statement, John. Um, typically, we group them into those categories where it's around on, uh, we think of mature reproducing animals having the largest effect or animals that are, will become reproduction animals. Um, and, and, and Dawn, grow finished pigs where feed intake is important. Uh, and it's monison is kind of all encompassing. Yes, which is part of the reason they're so dang frustrating. Absolutely. Yeah. So, okay, well, Tyler, that's great. Now let's move to testing. And I know you have quite a strong background in that area, personally. And so let's talk about testing of ingredients versus testing of mixed diets. How do I go about, if I have, uh, one, if I see mold in my crop, do uh, how would you suggest I go about sampling that crop to see if there's any mycotoxins present? Because of course you can have mold without mycotoxins. You can't have mycotoxins without mold, but you can have, have uh, mold without mycotoxins. How do I go about testing uh, my bin of grain uh, uh, for mycotoxins? What, what's your recommended procedure for doing that? Yeah, good question. Like you said, the presence of mold does not always indicate a toxin. Lots of times clients will say, you know, I saw some mold, so I, I know there's toxins in there. Or, or vice versa, they didn't see any mold, so they assume there's no toxins in there, right? And so even if they did see a mold and that mold is eliminated, the toxin will still be present in that grain. Right. That goes yes, yeah, yeah. Um, so if testing the actual grain itself, the biggest single most important piece is a representative sample. A lot of these toxins, they feed on damaged grains. So we'll see hot spots. So if there's a part of that field that was more prone to insect damage or bird damage or hail damage even, that chunk of the field is going to have a higher incidence of mycotoxins. So it's important that we take a representative sample um, when we're doing these testings. We took a organic feed sample of organic corn last year. We have a 2 kg sample, a very large sample size, divided it into four different subsamples. And within those samples, we had dawn ranging from 0.41 ppm to 1.4 ppm wow. in the same sample. Wow. Yes. And Fumona's in range from 0 0.58 ppm to 3.02 ppm, all in that same two kilogram sample. So representative sample is, is the most important piece there for sure. Yeah, and and, and not easy to get. I, I'm going to drill down on this one, if you don't mind, Tyler, because it is so important uh, because you can have a hot spot in the bin. You can have a, a leaky bin and the crop coming in was perfectly clean. And by the following spring, you got you got a real mess on your hands. So how help me to understand how I should sample my uh my uh my grain and even maybe it's a little easier to define how do i sample a truckload yeah good question the best way once the grain's in the bin it's a bit difficult to get a representative sample of that large bin space but what we can do is if we know how long it takes to empty that truckload into that bin we can take you know roughly 10 individual samples over the course of unloading that truck and by mixing those samples, we should get a relatively representative sample um, with the goal of catching those hot spots. And what would you recommend uh, a pork producer test for? Yeah, so swine, the, the most, I mean, all toxins are bad for swine. They're the most sensitive species. We talk about monogastrics and ruminants. Um, but Dawn is is very important. It's a of course. Uh, 
Aflo is less common up here, but we still suggest that people test for it just because it's at such low concentrations, it can be so effective and food more is in. Okay. So you would do all four. Ideally. Yeah. If you're looking at your, your crop, you know, corn is you know more prevalent to Zarelanol and things like that. Um, so we can make suggestions based on the type of grain as well. Sure. And is it a fair question for me to ask if I wanted to get all four tested, what would that cost me? It's a good question. It depends how you want to test it. So if you're testing, if you just want to indicate the presence of it and get a general idea of contamination, uh, the lateral flow strips are fairly inexpensive. I think the overall cost to run one of those tests is, is around $10 or $15. But if we want to send it off for uh, HPLC or ELISA or even PCR, then we're talking you know, probably closer to $100 to $200 for some of those tests. Now let's talk about testing the feed. I've got a barn and my pigs are performing just the way I would like them to. It's a pretty non-specific situation. Uh, I'm kind of looking at everything and mycotoxins is one of the things I want to consider, or at least I want to be able to eliminate as an issue in my, in my barn. How do I go about testing uh, or sampling the feed to be tested? So much like the grain, like representative sampling is very important. So if we're talking about a grow finished barn, you know, take samples from multiple feeders. Uh, multiple times throughout the day. Uh, the, the actual blending process of the complete feed does a good job of, of mixing those grains together, but we want to make sure that we account for any feed separation in the barn uh, or any feed produced at different times, arriving at different feeders during the day, that sort of thing. Right. And if I may just very briefly give an example of the importance of having a representative sample in a very different area, we've done uh, uh, quite a bit of work on calcium and phosphorus. And as you know, in the feed industry, getting a, a calcium assay result that looks like what it should look like is really, really difficult. And we found in, in our work after a lot of frustration that we just we had to take a representative sample the way you've described, but then we had to homogenize it very, very well. We had to be very, it wasn't just a case of dumping it in a bag and taking it to the lab. We had to take the samples and mix it thoroughly and went and then analyze it. And when we did that, we started getting calcium results that were decent. And calcium is uh, much easier than, mycoto than mycotoxins would be, but it illustrates the point what, that you're making. And, and I'm just emphasizing your point that you, you have to have a representative sample and you have to homogenize it well so that what you actually send to the lab or that you guys are testing or they test on their own if they have the equipment, that it is representative of what's in the, the barn. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's not just a simple thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. I agree uh, completely with that statement, John. Yeah. Okay. So was there anything else you wanted to say about the mycotoxins before we move to feed additives uh, and trying to We've we found the mycotoxin. Now we want it. What are we going to do about it? So, but there's there, before we go to that. Is there anything else you wanted to say on the mycotoxins themselves? Yeah, just regarding the testing, John. I mean, we talked about testing the grains. We talked about testing the complete feed. Um, the one thing we didn't touch on yet was testing the actual animal. So there's new technology out there right now um, where they're looking at biomarkers in the blood of these animals. So there's companies out there now where you can take blood, um, usually from the ear and a sow, for example and put it on a simple, just a paper card, there's blood spots on the card, send it away, and we can look for biomarkers in the blood. So these would be mycotoxin metabolites. And this gives us an indication. Um, it does a really good job of showing the presence of the toxins in that barn. It does, a, it's, it's less effective at looking at, you know, what concentration did that animal receive of those mycotoxins. If we look at something like Dawn, for instance, um, it peaks in the blood, roughly four hours after ingestion. So you look at a grow finish barn where pigs are fed ad lib, it's very difficult to sample a pig exactly four hours after they've eaten. <laughs> and then those, those same metabolites, six hours after they've eaten, they're basically cut in half. So it's a good indication of the presence of the toxin, um, but it's hard to use that data to determine the levels of toxins in the feed. Right. Right. Uh, the, um, given the sensitivity of the assay, um, could you find a uh, level of toxin in the blood 
which is, uh, let's say you, you're, you're using quantitative testing rather than qualitative testing. Uh, can you find levels of uh, toxin in the blood that are low enough that really you're not, you don't need to worry about clinical, um, uh, clinical manifestations? Or is it a case of if I find the toxin, then I know I have a problem and I have to take some action? I build on that and I would say that if you have found toxins, it would be good to compare a healthy animal from your barn to an animal showing some negative effects. So if you take blood samples from both animals, that could help you quantify that. Uh, if you have an animal that you know is healthy, it's doing well, um, versus a sow that's having some issues, for instance, you could compare those two animals. That could help you quantify to see if the mycotoxin is what could be causing that problem. Uh, that's a great suggestion. Yeah, that would be uh, that would be a good, very good way to, to approach that. Okay, great. Well, that's uh, thanks, thanks, Tyler. So now let's move to the feed additive area. Our time's moving on. Talk to me a bit about the, what you are looking for in uh, in feed additives that are going to be effective against mycotoxins, and um, uh, what what is it about those feed additives that make them effective? For sure. So when we look at feed additives, we basically have two different categories. We have what we call adsorbents. And then we have what we call biotransforming agents. So adsorbents would be products where their goal is to go through and bind that toxin and hang on to that toxin, then have the animal excrete that toxin. Where we look at biotransforming agents, things like enzymes or microorganisms that will go into that gut and they will physically alter that mycotoxin so that it's uh, in a non-active phase and will affect the animal. Um, th there's challenges with both, of course, with the adsorbents, there's generally two categories, one being clays and one being yeast cell wall type products. Uh, the, the clays are very, very good at binding polar mycotoxins, so mycotoxins that have a charge. Something like aflatoxin is quite easily bound versus other mycotoxins such as Dawn, Zarelanon. They have a unique structure. Um, they're non-polar, so they can't rely on the charge to be bound to those clays. So. Lots of times these manufacturers will modify these clays, increase the surface area, uh, sometimes wash them with different uh, fat emulsifiers and things like that to help their binding capacity to these, these non-polar mycotoxins. Um, and then the yeast cell wall products, you know, this is technology has been used for years to control things like salmonella and E. coli. So we're looking at things like, like moss-based products or beta-glucan-based products. And they, they act more like a sponge. Yeah, they act more like a sponge to just bind those toxins and have the animal excrete those toxins. Uh, and then we get to the other category. So that'd be the, the biotransforming type products. So here we look at, like I said, enzymes um, or even microorganisms that themselves can modify the structure of these toxins. Um, the challenge with these type of products is getting them to that gut where they can uh, modify those toxins. So we're talking about microorganisms. We're talking about they have to be viable by the time they reach that gut. So it's, it's a bit tricky. So, you know, we often suggest a product that has a combined approach. Um, it's more of a shotgun approach as opposed to a direct targeted approach. And then we also need to look at things like, you know, a lot of these toxins attack areas like the liver, for instance. So it's good to have a, a product or, or a set of products that have antioxidant capabilities as well. I, um, I know down here that um, uh, products containing uh, sodium metabisulfite are considered to be pretty effective, or at least as a starting point, to be effective. Is that a similar situation in Canada? Yeah, there's some emerging research on sodium metabisulfite, especially in regards to Dawn. Um, the challenge with sodium metabisulfite is that it has to be coated um, otherwise, the non-coated product actually affects feed intake. So when we coat it, we can put an enteric coating on it. That way the product makes it to the gut where it can act on Dawn. Um, and then also there's some research to show that it can affect thiamine as well. So we have to use supplemental thiamine when we look at sodium metabisulfate, but there is really good research to show that it has a good efficacy against Dawn. Right, yeah. The early, the early uh, uh, products that came on the market, and this is quite some time, it must be 20 years ago, uh, Thymin was, or was un, we were unaware that Thymin was an issue and that created some angst 
uh, until that was uh, figured out. And, and so yeah, thymine has to be a part of that, that equation. Um, our time's moving on. Unfortunately, Tyler, great subject. Uh, and you're, you've got lots of great information. Was there any other uh, messages you'd like to deliver or just a few wrap up comments that you'd like to make? For sure. The last thing I want to talk about, John, is just masked mycotoxins. So oftentimes we talk about toxins um, in their, their raw form, whetha it's Dons or Elanon from Mars and et cetera. But lots of times these, these crops or these plants where these toxins are present, they have a, their own defense mechanism as well. And oftentimes what they do is they'll attach something to the toxin to render it inactive. So in the case of Dawn, lots of times plants can attach a glucose to the third carbon, for instance. What this does is it allows the Dawn to move across cell, cell walls and it can permanently bind to things like cell walls at that point and be inactivated. It doesn't mean it's excreted, it's still there, it's still in the plant. What happens is our testing equipment has a hard time picking up this masked mycotoxin. And then when the animal ingests this product, of course, glucose is a product that's easily digested by monogastrics. So it cleaves that, that bond and Dawn is then reactivated. So I think oftentimes we're underestimating the total amount of toxins present um, through our testing. Sounds like the, the, the topic is uh, on the one hand becoming less complex because we're learning more about it. And on the other hand, it's becoming more complex because we're learning more about it. I would agree fully, yes. But there, sounds like the field of nutrition generally, doesn't it, Tyler? Absolutely. It's time for our famous three. Tyler, to, uh, to wrap things up now, as you're aware, we, have, uh, we ask all of our guests uh, three questions. And uh, so my first question to you is, do you have a favorite uh, swine book, reference book that you use or other reference that you would recommend to our listeners as a good source of information uh, on mycotoxins or just generally in swine nutrition? Yeah, I do. So I, I read quite a few books based on swine nutrition. Um, and with that in mind, my recommendation actually comes from uh, a different point of view. So my favorite book right now related to swine is called Pig Signals. And it's by uh, Jan Holsen and Key Sheepens. And basically what it does is it describes a lot of the behavior that we see in commercial swine production. And I found that has really helped going into barns and looking at it from a different perspective as opposed to just a nutritional um, or a health approach. So looking at those animals, seeing how they're behaving, what they're doing. Um, the book does a great job of describing different behavior uh, in those animals. Yeah, sounds interesting. Uh, so, the, and then the, the second uh, book that we, if you could recommend is any book now that you would recommend to our listening audience, whether it's a, a book that you found entertaining or one that you found to be of professional value to you. For sure. So I read quite a few books and one of my latest reads was called The Smartest Guys in the Room. And uh, it's actually a book based on the rise and fall of Enron. And uh, I highly recommend it. It's just a, a really good, interesting read and really insightful as to what goes on behind the scenes. Yes, that I would agree. That's a great book and a good good suggestion. And you know, it hasn't come up yet, interestingly, uh, at least in my experience um, as a host here. So thanks for bringing that up. And then my, our final question is, what is it, uh, Tyler, that um, about... Uh, people who are particularly successful as professionals in the area of swine production, but what makes them uh, particularly successful? What helps them to rise above the, the average? Yeah, good question. So I came into the industry fairly young, and I think something that really helped me um, was to find a good mentor. So find somebody that's been in the industry for, for quite a while that has a lot of experience. Uh, oftentimes these people are, they love what they do and, and they're willing to help young people. So I suggest really finding and connecting with a, a mentor or two uh, to help guide your journey and help, you know, learn where to focus and where to spend your time. Right. Well, and, uh, you know, interesting you say that, Tyler, when I was doing my PhD, um, I had a mentor there for a relatively brief period of time, only three years, obviously. And uh, but a very elderly gentleman, he was well into his 80s at the time, but he gave me advice that I used throughout my career. And, uh, and as you said, uh, people like that are very, very 
willing. In fact, they're probably often enthusiastic about helping younger people. So great suggestion. Uh, great conversation, Tyler. Really enjoyed it. Uh, learned a lot. I'm sure our listeners have learned a great deal. Uh, we really appreciate it. And I thank you once again for being on this uh, Swine It Canada podcast on mycotoxins. Yeah, thanks, John. It was a pleasure. I followed your work on, on energy and fiber specifically for years. So it's a pleasure to finally meet you and uh, be a guest on the podcast. It's always nice to put a face to a name. Tyler, thank you very much. Absolutely. Thanks, John.